Today's guest is Justin Case. Justin is the author of the book, Phases of Existence, Things I Learned When I Was Dead. In his book, he writes about being shot four times and how he ended up in a coma. While he was in a coma, he began to access memories from a past life. And we are going to find out about this story today. Justin, thank you so much for being my guest. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. I sure appreciate that. Mm, thank you. Hey, I guess I should tell you right off the bat, my name isn't Justin Case. I My publisher wouldn't let me use my real name to publish the book because he didn't want the uh, people who shot me to come back and use the book to track me down and shoot me again. So just in case they come looking for me. Uh, but my real name is Russ Horman. Oh, wow. Are you sure you want to say that? Oh, yeah. It's a concern for them, but it's not a concern for me for a couple of reasons. I'm not afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually reached out to help one of them that shot me to, to get out of prison a few years later. He was just a kid when it happened. Right. But... Uh, no, I think if he was to look me up, it would be to, you know, maybe thank thank him for, or thank me for helping him out. Right. All right. Well, let's start right on the day you got shot. I mean, because we want to know about your near-death experience, so we might as well, you know, hear your story, how you got shot, and then what happened. Well, actually, go back a little bit further. I, uh, uh, I had been... Um, the day I actually remember the day I got shot, we were having a party at my house and I had a friend, she, um, asked me if she could invite a couple friends over and I didn't see any problem with that. And basically was just setting me up to get robbed. Um, the guys came over and uh we were partying there for a little while and before i knew it one of them pulled the gun out and said hey give me all your money and and everything you've got and i didn't know that this uh, girl that was with me was in on it with them so i thought i had to protect her so i uh went to knock the gun out of this guy's hand and it hit the gun and it turned in his hand and he shot me twice in the chest one went in and out and the other one still in my chest and uh my adrenaline kicked in and i grabbed the gun away from him and uh we were scuffling and his partner came up behind me and shot me twice in the back wow that took all the wind out of my sails yeah i got shot in the heart the lung the, uh, my bowel, bladder, esophagus, small intestine. Um, yeah, it did a lot of damage to me. So that took the wind out of my sail. And, uh, and you know, when there's gunfire at a party, everybody just skedaddles. So everybody took off, and I was yelling for my roommate to call me an ambulance. And the police showed up, and... And they asked me uh, uh, what happened and who did this. And I didn't know the guy's names, but I just said, hey, can you just get me an ambulance? So the uh, paramedics showed up and I'm laying on my back. I could feel one of my lungs filling up full of blood. And I <clears throat> had to roll over on my side so I could breathe. And... Uh, so I told the paramedics I got to stay on my side and they kept me on my side and we talked all the way to the hospital in the ambulance. We talked to him till we got there. It was about 3 a.m. and they were outside waiting for me. When I pulled up and they opened up the back door, the nurse just started cutting my clothes off right there and putting a mask on me and, and I'm like, no, don't put a mask on me. Just fix me while I'm awake. Mm. And she said, no, you got to go to sleep. And I go, oh, I don't want to die. And she said, don't worry. You're not going to die. So she 
she put this mask on me and I'm thinking to myself, boy, I wish I just had a minute I could just call my mom and tell her I love her because I know I'm not going to make it through this. And the next thing I remember, I'm looking down at my body mm-hmm. and I'm thinking, I knew it. I knew I was going to die. I told her I did not want her to make me go to sleep. Mm-hmm. And, there, and, and I could see them all panicking, working on me and everything. And, uh, and I had this experience that a lot of people talk about. And it's, there's a lot of like familiar stories how mm-hmm. you see your body. And then, you know, I, I felt like I was being engulfed with warm clouds and I see a bright light. And I realize I'm in a wormhole going to another place. And I, I ended up on this planet. Wow. It was an actual place, and I know it's the spirit world. Mm-hmm. So and it's a beautiful place, man. It, it's incredible. And I talk a lot about this in the book in more details. Mm-hmm. Let me stop you there. You see yourself floating above your body. Did you watch your surgery for a while, or did you go immediately into a tunnel? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh I watched for a little while and I could see their scuffling and, you know, I could see something's not right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, uh, like I say, I felt these, you know, the room started filling full of clouds and it was like this warm, you know, uh, feeling I have. This transformation when you leave your body is... It is unbelievable. It is uh, exhilarating. It is liberating, wonderful transformation that you make. It's electrifying. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, no words can explain how how that feeling is. It's just the most wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. So, Well, tell me what that other planet was like. It looked like, uh, you know, it had a beach with an ocean and beautiful skies, but it was different colors. It was more like the the skies were were more orange, like our like our sunsets are, and the uh, the ocean was a, a prettier kind of reddish color too. And and just a lot, it was just these brilliant colors that I've never seen before. And I'm a painter. So I thought I knew all these colors, and these colors were just like colors I've never, you know, experienced. Was just, and there was beautiful trees and the flowers and everything. It was just real, real. I go into a little bit more detail in the book, and mm-hmm. but uh, I see other people there. I see them in human form, but they're more spirit. You know, they're spirit form. They're not physical, but I see them in a human shape. Mm-hmm. form and i'm they can see me too and i'm in that uh same form and um i see um i see my guardian angel and she comes to me and i in a look she communicates to me and i remember who she is and i realize Oh, like my whole life, there's been so many times that I should have died from so many different things. You know, I, I've had so many close calls and especially getting shot. I didn't realize why am I surviving all this stuff? Mm -hmm. When I seen her, I remembered she was there every time I had a close call, she was there helping me, protecting me, watching over me. And then I realized that she's not only my guardian angel, but she's my soulmate. We were together in a past life. Hmm. And when that life was over, I had to come back and do it all over again, but she didn't have to. Hmm. So as soon as you saw her, you immediately knew that she was your guardian angel or did it have to take a while for you to register that? Well, it was just like, like there was like a bunch of times in my life where 
this same person was in my life. And I didn't realize that. I had so many times I had seen her mm-hmm. until when I seen her in the spirit world, I remember she was there when I had all these close calls, which I go into a lot of detail in, in the book. Mm-hmm. Once I almost bled to death when I was a really, really little kid. Mm-hmm. And she came to me uh, as a candy striper in the hospital. Mm-hmm and comforted me and helped me through that ordeal but many times so i so i remember her and then um i started to remember put, putting things together on oh, we were together in this past life and mm-hmm. this past life was we were you know we're we were partners and when that I, that life ended i had to come back and do it all over again and she didn't have to mm-hmm. basically i think that I had things I still needed to learn. So one of the things that I learned in the spirit world was that um, uh, not only the best thing that will ever happen to you is you will die if you don't create a bunch of bad karma for yourself. The best thing that will ever happen to you is you will die and you'll shed this body and you'll have that magnificent transformation I was telling you about to your next phase of existence. But the reason we come to this phase of existence is because we need to learn things that you can only learn by getting a body. Like what is pain and passion and lust and love and everything associated with that stuff. Everything that you need to learn that you can't learn without a body. So we come here, we get this body, we're able to learn all that stuff, important things that's tied to so many uh, other things that we need to learn to progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not only a place to learn, but it's a testing place. Mm -hmm. We uh, have our own desires and we make which control, you know, our choices that we make, which, you know, the pathways we go down. Mm Whether we create good karma or bad karma, there's no such thing as medium karma. There's either good karma or bad karma. So if you're not creating good karma for yourself, most likely there's some bad karma that somewhere that you need to to look at and make an adjustment to. But I I believe this is a place to learn all that stuff that you can't learn without a body. And then when we learn all that stuff. We don't need our body anymore, and we move to our next phase of existence. Mm. And since we're all individuals, I believe that uh, heaven is not the same for everybody. Because what makes me happy is probably not going to make you happy or everybody else happy. We all have different desires, and uh, which which make us happy. So we we learn and we go grow and we advance from one phase of existence to another according to our desires and what we need to learn to progress Mm -hmm. and we learn and grow and advance and learn and grow and advance and become powerful until we become come to a place that we are content and then we that's where we stay we're content we're happy there so that would be what you're probably you're having whatever your heaven would be if it's to be with your family that you met in this life or a past life or or whatever that is it's individual to each person while you were there did you see god or jesus i didn't no i didn't i um boy that would have been something um no, nope, uh, I can't say that I did, and I've heard people that have, and I just think that's just uh, some of the stories I heard were just, just, uh, just unbelievable. Is uh, I don't <laughs> that would I mean on top of everything else, that would have just been. I'm gonna, mm-hmm. you'll probably have to edit all that out because I, t- <laughs> I, I don't know what I would do if I met Jesus. So no, I didn't meet Jesus or God or anything. Just my my guardian angel, who was my um, soulmate from a past life, mm-hmm. and uh, and I t- I wanted to stay with her, and she's like, no, you can't stay. You have to go back because 
you know, I want you to get through this and learn what you need to learn so we can be together. Right. And uh, mm. so. Did you see anybody else you knew it, while you were there, like other deceased relatives or anyone? No, I didn't. Nope, I didn't. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then how did you come back? What, did you choose to come back or were you forced to come back? Well, and you know, I think if I would have um, like wanted to stay and not come back, I bet you then probably I would have met Jesus. <laughs> I've heard of that happening before and a lady didn't want to come back and, and then that's when she met Jesus and Jesus made her come back because she had, actually had to come back for whatever her reason that was. But I realized that I had an emptiness inside me for a long time, my whole life, and not wondering why mm -hmm. I couldn't find the right person. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized, oh, I've got her in my life that filled like this emptiness I had inside of me. And, and I was able to just go back and, you know, because I knew I needed to go back. For some reason, I knew there was uh, things I needed to do that I needed to experience mm -hmm. so I could be go back to being with her, mm -hmm. which I've done a couple of things, I believe, that were reasons why I survived um, since this has all happened. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. From what I understand in your bio, you were in a coma. Obviously, before you went into a coma, you already left your body and went to this planet, which I'm assuming you call heaven. So, I call that the spirit world. The spirit world. Okay. While you were there, at some point, did you go into a coma or was that later? Okay. So there, well, I guess there's when they had complications. And uh, when I came to, I thought it was the next day, but um, my dad was there and he told me it had been 10 days. So I, I didn't realize any of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing I know is, is like, uh, have you ever heard somebody uh, where they get it banged on the head and then the next thing, you know, they can play the piano or they can speak French? Have you ever heard stories like that? I think so. Like head injuries. Well, I know that, you know, you can't learn French from getting banged in the head. But uh, when you have a head injury or when you go into a coma like I did, I believe you start accessing memories from a past life. Mm -hmm. And when I was in a coma, it's when I'm remembering all of his memories from being with her in his past life and things we did there. And um, so when I woke up, I had all those memories. It was just, and, you know, I think like when somebody get the, the, the person that got hit in the head and he could play the piano, mm -hmm. I think that is because he learned that in a past life is what I this is what I believe I don't know for a fact and then he accessed those memories so did you have any new abilities when you got back like playing musical instruments or painting you said you're a painter or anything well <laughs> astral projection that's what I walked away with um, I don't know if you know much about that but every night when it happened I was having these, I thought I was having these nightmares all the time. I'd go to sleep, I'd go somewhere, and people would chase me around and try to get me and stuff in places that I'd never been before, like an, an island somewhere in the Pacific or wherever. Every night I would go to bed, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to sleep again tonight. What is going to happen tonight? So this happened for quite a while, and I talked to somebody about it, uh, a psychologist tried to tell me that, well, look, you got shot four times, you got PTSD, and your brain, this is how your brain is helping you cope with that. And I'm like, well, you know, kind of that might make sense. Okay. So I went, I'll okay, believe that, I guess. And uh, so I kept uh, going to sleep. I'd go somewhere and that I've never been to before. And and have these experiences where people would see me like I was a ghost and chase me and wave the Bible at me and stuff. Mm. And anyway, so this happened for quite a long time. And mm. one night 
um, I went to my mom's bedside and she woke up and seen me and it scared her. And then I kind of got scared and I went back to my body and I woke up the next morning and went, oh my gosh, was that a dream? And my mom calls me first thing in the morning and says, oh, I thought you passed away. I seen your spirit last night. And I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm, I, I was actually there because I, I remember seeing that. Mm -hmm. That's when I realized I was actually leaving my body and going to different places. Wow. This is amazing. If you're still doing it now, can you control it? Like you're going to say, hey, I want to go to France tonight and see the Eiffel Tower. I wish. Oh, man. <laughs> that would be so cool. So I think if I tried studying like um, – I'm trying to remember what the, uh, the other one is. Um, there's another one that's like astral projection. Uh the army used it for a oh, lot of years. Remote viewing? Remote viewing. Yeah, I would love to study remote viewing and go. I I wouldn't stop in France. I would go to like Mars if I could. Mm. Uh, so for the longest time, and I realized what I was doing, that was a big step towards control. So I basically, you know, got into a lot of uh, meditation and that kind of stuff to get it under control. Mm -hmm. And there's only been one time that I needed to go uh, check on a family member. And I was concerned about this family member. And, uh, and then I went to see that family member and had that experience. And that's the only time I could control where I wanted to go because I was really concerned about that person. Mm -hmm. So I was focused on that. And I was able to go and see the situation, which made me feel a lot better. But, uh, no, I, I would love to be able to control it like remote viewing. That would be so awesome. Mm -hmm. So you knew that you had this person on the other side that you'd spent a past life with before, maybe many past lives. Once you came back, did you decide not to be in any more relationships because you're still waiting for her, or did you carry on and still become in relationships? No, I um, I was in denial for a long time, mm -hmm. and but uh, no, I got in, involved with so I, I got was getting involved with a. a couple different ladies and I've was had a, just a long-term relationship for about 10 years but I got my I got a daughter that's 14 I got her when she was five months old and pretty much you know raised her myself mm -hmm. and uh, I think she's one reason why I survived because I kind of saved her from like being stuck in like this some kind of system or something mm -hmm. uh, she'd been a blessing to me so but uh, well, well, now what was the question again? <laughs> I was saying that, and I think you already answered it. I was just saying, you basically answered it. It was just that, you know, when you came back, did you avoid getting in relationships because you were, you were waiting mm. for the woman on the other side or not? But you said you were in some long distance relationships. So, and you were in, yeah, that, I've, so. I've had some relationships, some that are serious. And, and I believe that, you know, that's positive energy. When you get more positive energy, mm -hmm. it, it gets stronger and negative, negative energy like takes away from that. So mm -hmm. like, um, I think being in good, positive, strong relationships is good and stronger. And maybe I'll be, uh, find somebody that wants to be attached to me in the next phase of existence. I'm with, with, my soulmate and that would make it more energy that would make it stronger mm -hmm. it, there's not like jealousy it, it, it depends on the person and that there's that would be negative energy that i would stay away from but right. uh, you you know you can build on that and make it stronger mm -hmm. so uh which i do I, as much as i can yeah and and plus i mean if she's there I would think that she doesn't expect you to be waiting around for her. You know, you're here anyways to be experiencing life with a body. Well, and I think that's just it. I, the reason why I came back, mm -hmm. I believe what I had to learn, I think was heartbreak. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. because I we were happy together and everything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't think I experienced any of that because I think in this life, and maybe the karma I created in, in the early this life or or from what happened in past lives, but I don't ever think I learned heartbreak. You know, I think that was one that, you know, it's tied to so many things, you know, humility and everything else that I needed to learn that. And I think I got a good heavy dose of it on this, in this life. And I did learn a lot, mm-hmm. which I needed to learn. I'm glad I learned. Good. Do you have any other after effects of this experience that you feel like you have to manage within this life? Well, spiritually and physically, I mean, you know, physically I'm dealing with stuff because I got PTSD and like there have been times where I, I would wake up, you know, like I was in the middle of a boxing match and I'm punching my sweetheart sleeping next to me and I'm, I'm punching her accidentally. She, and she has to wake me up. So, you know, that's, there's some things that's hard to deal with physically like that, but like emotionally, it, uh, I feel like I, I'm trying, I want, I dedicated my life to helping kids that I see starving to death on mm-hmm. the streets mm-hmm. and um, times like Christmas and, and Thanksgiving, it's hard for me. It's really hard because I remember, I'll never forget the images burned in my, my mind of these kids that they're starving to death. And also you know, I wrote this book to raise money for kids that age out of foster care Mm -hmm. and they don't have a place to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 30,000 plus kids age out of foster care in this country plus every year. And it's like 70% of them fall through the cracks Mm -hmm. and don't have a place to go. And if you know anybody that's 18, look at them. Are they old enough to be on their own? I don't think so. <laughs> Most right. 18 year olds I know are immature, but it's like sink or swim situation for them. Right. So I deal with a lot of emotions that I want to do more than I possibly can do because I want to help these kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I wrote the book and just dedicated my life to that so I can make a difference in this life. Mm, that's great. Do a lot of people that you know personally know about your near-death experience or is it something that you don't really talk to with people in general for i would say like 15 years or more i was just like i didn't want to talk about it Mm -hmm. i didn't want to deal with it i don't want people to think i'm crazy plus i wasn't maybe i didn't have well i was in denial and and i didn't want to deal with it you know uh, maybe I still wanted to keep going down the pathway I was going down for a while and I didn't want to deal with it. But once I finally, you know, straighten myself out and everything and, and I've got my, my priorities, I always liked helping the homeless no matter what. Mm-hmm. But uh, after this, I just, I just realized this is my chance to make a difference. And, I'm now I'm, I'm slipping away. I got to do something now. And so I'm, uh, this book wrote itself. I just told everybody exactly what happened. It's a true story. Right. When I was growing up, I had a lot of, uh, uh, problems with police growing up and my mm-hmm. dad was a cop. Wow. And, uh, so I went down a rough road and it talks a lot about that, but mm-hmm. I dropped out of school and then I, you know, later on, I went back and got my bachelor's and my master's degree. Oh, that's great. So this it's impacted my life in so many different ways. What are some of the biggest misunderstandings that people have about you that know about your experience? What kind of funny thing one lady said one time, because I said I flatlined for six minutes mm-hmm. and then I told her everything I learned and then she's, and I, I drive for Uber. So I talked to, you know, some people and this lady said, oh, you learned all that in six minutes, huh? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know what? When you're in this body, in this shell, you're living and breathing, time is relevant. You're getting older, you're getting bigger, you're learning. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of ways time is relevant. But when you're not in this body anymore, time Mm -hmm. isn't relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, there's the people that there's a lot of people that just want to be um, unbelievers, and then, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. I was, I used to kid with people all the time, you know, about UFOs, which I <laughs> I believe in UFOs now. But when I was growing up, I'd like yeah, you seen UFOs, you know, or ghosts or something whatnot. And now I believe in all that stuff. <laughs> It's interesting that you mentioned time because I wanted to ask this earlier. So you were in a coma for 10 days while you were there and having, you know, these experiences, maybe seeing past lives. Did it feel like it was longer than 10 days or did it feel less than 10 days? Or is there any uh, estimation of time that comes to your mind? No, like I said, I thought it was the next day. But when I learned all that spiritual stuff in that little that little short window of when I flatlined uh, had that experience I learned that stuff but mm-hmm. then when I was in my coma is when I recalled everything from my past life and everything so I when it like I say when I woke up I thought it was the next day and I'm telling my dad hey I know the I know the Bible now and he, like I've read it 10 times and mm-hmm. and uh He's, yeah, right. You know the Bible. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> when hell freezes over, I know the Bible. But actually, I r- recall a lot of stuff that I didn't know before. Mm-hmm. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, what other things do you recall? Well, I just remember um, things that I knew or beliefs that I had in the past life. And this brought me back to to like being able to feel that way. In this life, like, I am not a real religious person, but I'm a spiritual person, Mm -hmm. and I like to live my life in the philosophy of Buddhism. I think that is, you know, a beautiful way to be, to try to be, you know, connected with everything around you and try to, you know, I, I really think karma is so important. Karma is is everything it's so important do you have any regrets about coming back no i don't and i'll tell you why because i told you about this this kid i got and uh she she's so such a wonderful kid man and i i went through a lot of a funny really kind of an interesting situation how i got her Mm. And uh, she's just been a joy to my life. So I realized she is definitely one reason why I survived mm. was for her. How did you get her? Well, I was, <laughs> I was on this cruise. And uh, the last night of the cruise, I was, I was praying. I was saying, God, I want to have a baby. I, I don't need a girlfriend or wife. I just want to have a kid. I, I can't get pregnant. <laughs> For God, and I'm serious, you got to be careful what you uh, wish for. I, I pray to say, God, I want to have a baby. I really don't care about a relationship, but I want to have a baby. And the, the next day, I came back home off that cruise. There was a situation where I was helping a homeless couple uh, in an apartment, and I went over to check on them, and there was a, an, another homeless lady there and this little baby there. And I seen that baby, and I just, it, she looked so beautiful. I just was in love with her like that. And I've always thought babies were ugly, but this baby was mm-hmm. so beautiful. She was glowed. Uh-huh. And then they were doing drugs, and I had to yell at them and say, what are you guys doing, you know, and doing this around these, the baby for and everything. And then she would say, well, I'm homeless, and we've been living in a car in a building, and, uh, and, I don't have a place. And I'm like, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. I'll show you where I live. You let me take your baby. You can come see her anytime you want. And she didn't know me from Jack the Ripper and let me take the baby. She seen, you know, my house came over to my house and everything and left the baby with me. Wow. And the next day I called my attorney and, and we had the papers drawn up and, you know, had it all signed <laughs> and legal and everything. It's, I'm honest, she's an answer to a prayer. Oh, that's amazing. Totally true story. What inspires you most about your experience when you think about it? You know, I 
this is an opportunity for not only for me, but for everybody. Mm -hmm. If everybody can just find one thing to be passionate about, whether it's your uh, dogs or the elderly or trees, whatever, find something to be passionate about and put your energy into that and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And my, my love and my, for, for my daughter and my, heart goes out to these kids that I see in the Philippines, these kids, they were starving to death. It's something I'll never forget. And kids here in the U S when we kick them out when they're 18, they're starving to death. Mm -hmm. We need to help them. So I got this website, ageoutkids.com. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell people, please go there. I like, I'm still trying to fix the, the donation tab thing, <laughs> but you can buy the book there. All the money goes to help those kids. Mm -hmm. And then you can see, you know, what I'm about, what they're about, ageoutkids.com. And that's my my passion. Yeah, I want to make a difference in and help these kids while I'm still on this earth. Mm -hmm. That is so important to me. And I know every I really hope that everybody can find something to be passionate about. Mm, that's great. It's great that you do that. So you said you weren't a religious person before and after. You're a spiritual person. But did you have any paranormal experiences before this? Um, no, I, I never, never did have anything paranormal happen to me before that. Right. But after that, I had a, a couple interesting mm -hmm. um, things happened to me i think i talked about one of them in my book mm -hmm. but uh, i think that's because i'm you know i'm meditating and i'm and i'm on a different level than i was before i think of what was my surroundings are and mm -hmm. trying to be more in tune with everything that mm -hmm. that stuff was there before but i just was oblivious to it Right. So do you have any other projects that you're working on that you want people to know about? I have got a lot that I want to do. I, a, a lot I want to do, which makes it so hard for me because I can only do so much. Mm -hmm. But I really need to buy a building and transpose it into something that I can get kids off the streets and into a place so I can, uh, I want to start an independent living program and a trade school for these kids that are homeless. And uh, it's a six month program where I can take a kid in and get him on the job training, him or her on the job training mm -hmm. and in an apartment and, and get, it gives them six months to help them do that. Mm. And I want to get kids off the street now. I, I do what maybe I need to start a revolution and hey the government knows about these kids we need everybody needs to learn about all these kids that are out there that need our help yeah yeah I think that's great now a lot of people who may be listening to this podcast may have had a near-death experience and not even told anybody about it do you have any advice for people who've had near-death experiences? Well, you know, you know, I would, I think I hear a lot of really neat stuff on Facebook because uh, there's a bunch of resources there mm -hmm. and, uh, and I get into some pretty interesting conversations on Facebook. There's a lot of people on Facebook that have had near death experiences uh, of, of lots of different kinds. So that's just a really, really good resource to go and check that out. And then you're going to get into maybe a situation where you're going to get some peers and a support group that you feel comfortable about talking about. Cause you can't just talk about to about anybody because not everybody is going to, you know, people can be judged, you know, judge, judge you. And, you know, sometimes people, uh, avoid that especially in work situation is they don't want to be judged you know and stuff like this there's a place to talk about it, a place not to talk about it so that's a good resource too is go and, and search you know near-death experience there's about five or six big groups on there and I'm, I'm trying to put one together i'm not real computer savvy so I, I think i need to have my my kid fix all these uh 
computer problems I have, but uh, hopefully when I get all that going, people will be able to go to my website and make donations. And on that website, I'm going to show where every penny is spent, mm -hmm. where every penny I get. So somebody will make a donation and they'll see that donation come up on that website. And if anybody makes a donation and it does not show up on that website, they see I'm accountable for that. Mm -hmm. it, I'm going to be totally transparent and you'll, anybody can see that donation and then they'll see where that money went. All that money, all the money from my book and every penny I get will go basically to get housing and get kids off the streets and help them get into an apartment. And I'll show everything transparently on that website, ageoutkids.com. Right. Now your book, Phases of Existence, is it only sold on your website or is it sold like on Amazon and Google Books and the other places? So it's Phases of Existence and Things I Learned When I Was Dead. And it is sold wherever books are sold. It is on Amazon. It is at Barnes & Noble or it should be by now, hopefully, mm -hmm. and you can buy it at the website as well. It's on Amazon, and you can download it, uh, Kindle or digital version. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, any, anywhere you would get books or that website. Okay. So I believe you're in Salt Lake City. Is that true? That's right, yeah. Do you see a lot of homeless kids out on the streets in Salt Lake City? Oh my gosh, it's sad. It's sad. You know, and it's cold here. So mm -hmm. like days like today and you you, you see them in tents. Wow. And 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 you know, and the, the the city comes along and they take all their stuff and they throw it away mm -hmm. and there's not a place for them to go. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. It's just heartbreaking. Not enough is being done. Mm -hmm. For these poor people and it's so cold here in salt lake so a lot of these kids i believe you were saying earlier they're orphans but then once they turn 18 they're kind of kicked out of the system and said okay you're 18 you're out and then they just have to kind of go fend for themselves right hardly any safety net at all these kids every one of these kids should have a cell phone and proper training and a safety net and and lifetime connections and they all fall through the cracks and it's 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 a failing system it helps a lot because you know people a lot of people that are good people are foster mm -hmm. parents and we need more foster parents right uh, but you know m most of the reason they do it they, they love to do it but they get paid to do it too right and when a kid turns 18, they lose that, um, that money for that child. Right. And then that, and they can't afford to pay for it themselves. They right. probably, you know, there's great, wonderful people, but you know, you know, they're, they basically graduate high school and that, you know, sink or swim. That's it. Wow. That's kind of strange. I couldn't, you know, if I had a foster child and I had spent years maybe with him or something, then I developed a relationship. I still couldn't just see him, you know, just because the money dry, just kicking him out of the house and say, well, that's because you're a wonderful later. person, but you know, and you could take in one child and that would be total, like everybody would be that way. But these, a lot of these kids are in group homes that have, you know, a dozen kids. They're in, and they're old enough. Nobody wants to adopt them, and then they go to a group home. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're nobody's going to adopt them. So they they don't have that that support system that mm -hmm. everybody needs. So I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my parents to help me. They were wonderful, but at eighteen, you know, they're just not. Uh, I would say mentally mature enough to be on their own most of them you know for naturally can't do it so something's got to get done for these kids we really need to start a revolution and just tell show how many kids are out there right this, uh, hopefully i can do that with this website yeah i'm glad you brought it to my attention because i did i had no idea that all this was going on i was just not on my radar and it's not on a lot of people's radar 
And when you see a commercial come on, you know, at halftime and it shows these kids that are bloated and they've got flies on them and they're actually starving to death. And if you actually see that in real life Mm -hmm. and the commercial's not over and the football game is back on and you forget it. But when you see it in real life, it gets burned in your memory and you will never forget that. Right. All right. Well, just now I'm starting to call you Justin instead of (laughs) instead of Russ. Is it Justin or Russ? It's Russ Horman. All right, Russ. Before we wrap it up here, do you have one last message of hope that you want to share with us? You know, I I want everybody to find something to be passionate about. And I want to say something. I do realize that there is evil out there and there's a balance between good and evil out there. But there's a thing about evil. It's actually uh, necessary to have because without it we wouldn't have freedom of choice so we come here and we learn and grow and we make choices and go down different pathways and we have our own journeys and everything but if there was no evil and bad it would only be good then we wouldn't have freedom of choice we wouldn't have that ability way to make a choice between good or evil or our agency which way we wanted to go because there wouldn't be any evil so, you know, it's discouraging when you see a lot of things going on nowadays that are despicable, unforgivable things that are going on. Please forgive them anyway, because it's easier uh, to forgive. Like I forgave the guy that shot me. I went to his parole hearing and begged to let him out because he was 17 when he shot me. And uh, when he turned 18, he went to prison. He was facing five to 15 years. And I didn't want any part of that. Mm-hmm. So, and he was just a kid. So I went to his pro hearing and I asked him, let him go. Give him a, at least keep him on a tight leash. Mm-hmm. Please forgive out there. The evil happens. It's, it, but rise above and try to think about every decision you make. Is this going to make good karma or is this going to make bad karma? Make every, de- every choice should be based on good karma, every choice. And that will build this up. Uh, a wonderful energy will build inside you. And it's a, it's a good cycle to get into. And it, you know, make, it's definitely makes it easier to face every day to try to do what you can do. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that message. Um, just curious. Did that person thank you for trying to help him get out of jail? And did you have any more correspondence with him over the years? No, it's sad. He he was in a kind of behind of a, a glass uh, wall or something. And he had a speaker in there. And he seen me there. So he was nervous when he seen me. But then when I went, they asked me and I was talking on the microphone. I told him, hey, you know, this is, he's a kid. He's got plants. He made a mistake. We all do stupid stuff when we're young. Give him a chance. Let him out. Keep him on tight leash. And if he messes up, bring him back to prison. But give him a chance. And, mm-hmm. and he was looking like, oh, my. I can see he was like well enough. He was he was really touched by that. And and. Uh, after everything was said and done, I'm walking down the hall. I could hear him yell out at me, "Hey, thank you, I love you," and um, and I I I wish he would have got out, but it's been 15 years, and they they didn't let him out then. And I guess maybe he got to some scuffles in there, and I don't know if he ever got out. Mm. And it's it hurts me to be a part of that. I feel like. I got a lot of good karma to make to fix that one. Right. But well, I don't see you being responsible for that. And you did your part. Do you feel that because of your near death experience, that's what made you so kind towards him? You know, that kind of experience does change people. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I was all about myself, you know, like everybody. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all want to like accumulate stuff, learn and grow and, um, you know, enrich their lives with things and stuff. And that's where I was at before I got shot. But when you're dying 
And I wish I could have called my mom when I was dying, tell her I love you. Because when you're dying, that's going to put things in for priority. You don't think about your truck. You don't think about your fancy condo or cabin or house, whatever boat. You think about my loved ones. Like, oh, my gosh, that's all that really matters. So it puts things in priority. So I'd say, like, live every day like your last day. Make sure you tell everybody I love you when you say goodbye because you don't know if it's the last chance. You'll have to say I love you. Yeah, I think that's great. All right, Russ. Well, I really appreciate you giving me this time today. I hope this podcast helps your book raise lots of money for these kids. And I wish you a a happy holidays, and um, I hope you have a great evening. Hey, thanks a lot. I wish all that for you, too. Take care. Merry Christmas. Okay, Merry Christmas.